A man's life was taken at the hands of an enraged murderer. But once the verdict was thrown out on a technicality, the killer got another shot to present his case to a jury. The victim's family then decided to take on the production company and the very show they believed had a hand in their son's death. The outcome would have an impact on television and the legal system that would last for decades. This week's episode is The Jenny Jones Show Murder, Part 2. In the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister How are you? Oh, my goodness. Just been uh, staying in and only getting outside to run, but it has been hot. Dude, it became summer and nobody asked either one of us if that was okay. (laughs) Correct. I was not warned. One day it was 70 and the next day it was 95. And I was like, what has happened? What is that? I mean, I'll go for a run right at 5, 530 when I'm done with work. And I thought the other day I was like, oh, and then during the day the other day I said, I'll run this. uh, I needed to give you a recording Yes. item and i'm like i'll just run it to your house and you're like you're gonna die you were right <laughs> that was rough. i had to walk home <laughs> it's very hot I, I was beat red i was um i was a little concerned yeah it's like i'm gonna walk <laughs> outside and you're just gonna be collapsed in my front yard <laughs> you know what no better place for me to collapse so it's among friends <laughs> but it was toasty i've just been how long yeah. does and it this- take you to run from your house to my house um, if it's not a million degrees, probably, it's probably about a mile and a half. So maybe like 20 minutes. Okay. That's what I was thinking it would be. Yeah. But it's like 1.6 something miles. So it's like a little over a mile and a half. So I ended up well, walking part of the way home. Yeah, so I would not. I, I mean, I probably would have called Tommy to come pick me up to be quite honest. Cause <laughs> it's not like when you get, idea. when did you, and you get that that stitch in your side, you know, that pain in your side from running and you're just like dehydrated. And I have been hydrating. The thing that you brought me, which is a pop filter is not a small thing. It's very long. It's probably, so I was, so I'm (laughs) the thought of you running, holding this thing is very funny to me. It's, I was wielding it for those of you who don't know, it's about as the, the thing is about as big as a pan, nice size pancake, and it covers the microphone so we don't spit on it. And then there's a long bendy, like a long bendy straight part. And I was holding it like a giant lollipop or like an Olympic torch. And I was just <laughs> nice. running like that. And the, a woman, I passed a woman and her daughter, and they just looked at me and I said, I'm running an errand for my friend. And they were like, That's not helpful. Like, that you doesn't explain you anything. You should have said, I'm looking for my relay partner. Exactly. You're in some you crazy like, relay race. <laughs> Let me hand this off to you guys. <laughs> Just recording a podcast while I run. No, I was, uh, but I figured if anybody tried to hassle me, I could wield it that as a weapon. That's true. You know what? A lot of people around here just go on walks with uh, giant sticks <laughs> and golf clubs. And then somebody on next door asked why. And people were like, because of the wild dogs. <laughs> Like, what <laughs> wild dogs have taken over the neighborhood? I've never seen them. I don't know. But my neighbor uh, walks around with a big ass stick every time I see her walking around. So maybe there there's are a man. Some. I cussed a man out in my neighborhood, which I'm not proud of myself. I don't normally cuss people out. But he was in his front yard with his dogs on leashes. They were two very vicious shih tzus. And he, he just straight up set the leashes down to turn around and, like, pick up some leaves. And the dogs, of course, they see me walking with my two dogs. They just run towards mm. us. So I pick up Lucy. They start biting at Buffy, who's very nice. She's But she also looks like a pit bull. I mean, she's like 70-pound hound dog. And she doesn't really know how to respond, but it's about to be violent. And the guy goes like, oh, no. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, catch your fucking dogs, you fucking idiot. I'm like, leashes only work if you hold them. What did he like, say? He was like, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he just took the dogs and walked off. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was so mad. Oh, yeah. I was so mad. Uh, that's one thing that really grinds my gears is when people, especially when they'll be walking them and the dog is just dragging the leash. And I'm like, what's yes. the point of this? Which is kind of like everywhere I go lately, people wearing masks around their neck. No. Or pulled keeps down under their mouth. I'm like, what good is this doing? 
Or people's noses hanging out. I can't get the image out on the internet of the meme people posted where it's like wearing a mask with your nose out. It's like wearing pants with your dick out. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it doesn't it, do any good. It doesn't work. That's not how it's meant to be done. But I, I imagine if I people wore it. pants like that, you would get thrown out of the Whole Foods. Like, yeah. I, zip it up. Uh, there was a tweet the other day that was all about comparing coronavirus and people going out and being asked to like go back to work and stuff to um, – a kid shitting in a public pool and all of the stuff like if a kid shits in a public pool and there's a turd floating around there's a protocol everyone has to get out of the pool the -hmm. workers have to skim the pool get the turd out then you have to disinfect all this stuff yeah before anybody wants to go back in and it was basically like would you would you still go back in if the turd was in there and everyone's like it's fine guys everybody back in no of course not but, but you, the turd's not going to touch me, Christy. It's on the other side of the pool. It's like, it's still I in guess the pool. It's still in the pool. All those little it's particles still... floating around. Ugh. Dude yeah. Particles. Well, speaking of turds. You know who's a freaking turd? Jenny Jones is a turd. She, you know what? Going back and watching the um, smug-ish, if not just fully smug way that she responded to Not only the cross-examination, or I guess it was direct examination in the civil trial, but then just, like, all the interviews. You know what? In her her defense, one, she does good work now. mm -hmm. Two, in the civil trial, when Figer is going at her, he's a son of a bitch. And I was was impressed that she held her own and was like, I'm not going to let you bully me and, like, Mm -hmm. uh, coerce me into saying stuff that I don't agree with and everything. So I was actually impressed that she kind of stood her ground and and was confident and didn't let him shake her. He's a tough one, though. He He is. Every single person. He's a bulldog. But also not a bulldog in a good way, in my opinion. He just (laughs) seems, like, slimy and um, I feel like he could go for on either side of the... The aisle, it's just who's mm-hmm. paying him. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, true. I didn't get the impression he really believes what he's doing. It's just like, this is the person that hired me. So I'm going to throw my uh, weight behind this guy. He's like, I would love 33% of $29 million. Dude, so wouldn't we all? Uh huh. Well, we're going to be talking about um, the appeal today. The, or we talked about the appeal last time, the second trial, the civil trial, and then a bunch of other stuff. So if you haven't listened to the first episode, go back and do that. Also, I think I've put another piece of the puzzle into why the second episodes always have more. No, Mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense. I was about to say, because somebody told me that they wait and listen to them at the same time. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't really, that wouldn't make it. The second one have more. So never mind. That's, we can't figure out why can't this figure it part out. two. Part two's always got more listens. Some people part, have like, messaged four. and said they listened to part two again. So oh, okay. maybe that's why. But inevitably, it always has way more downloads and we can't figure it out. Perhaps we're not meant to figure it out. It's just <laughs> it's one of those things. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. After Jonathan Schmitz's conviction for second-degree murder was overturned based on a technicality involving juror selection, the Michigan Court of Appeals was forced to send it back to the lower court for another trial. The prosecutor in the second trial framed Jonathan as having overreacted to the whole television show ordeal. In her opening statements, she said, The only reason that murder is an issue is that Scott Amador was gay and Schmitz's manhood, so to speak, was insulted on national TV. Well, you know what? Get over it. I got to say, I agree with this lady. Oh, yeah. I mean, she was great. And the whole, the framing it as he's his manhood or his. No, you're not being reasonable. You're being a premeditated murderer. <laughs> what this all boils down to is someone got upset, uh, upset enough to kill because somebody of the same sex had a crush on them. Mm-hmm. That is full stop. That is what this boils down to. Whatever I mean, were there mental health things in play? Perhaps all of that, but that's what this is about. If this had been a woman Mm-mm. that had, if it had been his ex fiance, like he thought it was going to be, or somebody or from coworker, work, or, or even Donna, who mm-hmm. he when he walked out, he probably probably thought, oh, it's Donna, 
mm-hmm. wouldn't have killed her. This wouldn't have been a thing. It would have been over and done with. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he has the same anatomy as you get is just wild to me that this even could go to trial, that this could be as far, presented. As far as the, the, yeah, the civil trial goes and everything. It's just, it's wild. Yeah, it was... That was, we'll get into it. It's called the gay panic defense. And yep. then we also saw the trans panic defense. And it's not something that should mitigate someone's behavior, but it was unfortunately untold repeated times used to mitigate someone's behavior. And honestly, it's it's singling out LGBTQ people in a, and they're getting disparate treatment and their lives don't matter as much, according to the justice system in this case. And then, you know, in other subsequent uh, trials, it just, it, it's like, it would be like you said, well, I, you know, I'm a white guy and, uh, you know, a black woman hit on me and it yeah. made me freak out so bad. And it's like, that doesn't, that's not rational. That's not reasonable. That's not a mitigating thing. You are an unreasonable, bad person and you deserve to be fully punished. It shouldn't be like, oh, well, that totally makes sense if it's that kind of victim. It's like, no, you are dis- treating victims disparately when that's not something that's relevant to the perpetrator's behavior. Anyone is allowed to have feelings for anyone. Yeah. That and is not a, a crime. It has never been, is, nor will it ever be, because that's just, that's your personal feelings. And it shouldn't ever be taken into account your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, your religion, or anything like that is completely off the table when it comes to shit like this. And they always say, you know, in the the legislation or whatever, it's the nonviolent sexual like come ons like you can say like i have a crush on you i like you obviously you can't grab someone and hold them down and attack them sure. you know that's totally different but if it's just something like this where it's like hey i like you and i've had thoughts about you or whatever that's not enough whatsoever to you know that's not an attack on you no for the second trial jonathan's attorney argued for manslaughter an even lesser offense than second degree murder the defense's argument in this new trial hinged on the idea that Jonathan was doggedly pursued by Scott after the taping, causing Jonathan to, quote, lose all reason and not be in control of his behavior. It was fucking sick. They tried to paint it that Scott was a stalker. He was a monster. He left this note because he was a he was chasing Jonathan down and Jonathan couldn't escape. And this was his only way out. It's like bullshit. Jonathan went out drinking with him. Yes. After he flew on the same plane home with him, they all went out drinking, apparently also made plans to go shopping together the following weekend. Mm -mm. That's not the behavior of someone that is terrified or being doggedly pursued by someone inappropriately. No. The jury deliberation took less than three hours over the course of two days. According to the LA Times, during the deliberation... The jurors asked to see the anonymous note that Scott left for Jonathan on his front door, which had been attached to a blinking construction light. Probably because they wanted to see, you know, exactly how is it written? What does it say? It's not like I'm into you and I'm going to come get you. You know, it was flirty, silly, whatever. Yeah. On August 27th, 1999, Jonathan was convicted a second time of second degree murder and was sentenced to 25 to 50 years in prison the same conviction and punishment he received in the first trial. After the verdict, juror Kimberly Manny told the L.A. Times, If he was gay and a woman approached him that way, would it have been right for him to kill her because she put a note and a flashing light in his door? No, well, that's a good it would point. not. Yeah, and, no. No, and of course not. Of course not. And this wouldn't even be a trial if, no. if, she was, if it was a woman. No. While the first criminal trial was pending, Scott's family had filed a $25 million civil lawsuit against Jenny Jones and Telepictures Productions, a division of Warner Brothers, which produced the show. The family hired Jeffrey Figer, an attorney and Detroit-area radio talk show host, famous for representing Dr. Jack Kevorkian, to represent them. The lawsuit alleged that the TV show was responsible for Scott Amador's death because Jonathan's actions were a direct and proximate result of the actions of the Jenny Jones show. Yeah, the really sh- horrifying thing that you find out in trial by media is that the same conglomerate owned Jenny Jones and also Court, Court TV. TV. So yep. they made plenty of money Total, out yeah. on this lawsuit. And Frank Amador says, like, we're suing the production company we think is responsible for my brother's death. And that same company is making a ton of money off the fact that we're suing them because it's all being televised. So either way, all the, either way, they're getting screwed. 
Mm-hmm. It's a win-win for Warner Brothers. I mean, obviously, they don't want to lose the trial, but... Is that not some sort of conflict of interest where they shouldn't have been allowed to film it because of that? It feels icky, ethically speaking, but I, at the time, I mean, and I, I'd have to do more research, but at the time, I don't know that there was another comparable channel that would play just straight up court proceedings. So it's not like if there was an option to have company A and company B, you know, in the courtroom and the defendant said, oh, we really want company A in the courtroom because it was part of their conglomerate. And then you kind of edge somebody else out in order to make profit. But since they were the only player at the time, I don't I mean, it feels icky morally, but I don't think it's like illegal. I mean, I guess the option would be this just doesn't get filmed. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, get out there, which I mean, for the family, I think they want Jeffrey Figer for sure wanted it to be on television. That man was like, again, talk about a win win. You know, you're either going to get 33 percent of this, assuming he's doing it on contingency. You know, you're going to get a chunk of the winnings or you're going to just get the the exposure and be famous. Publicity, Absolutely. And he was already a bit of it. I mean, he was known for being a showboat and Mm -hmm. going after huge cases that many said he didn't even care if he lost, he just mm-hmm. wanted his name that he represented this like big ticket client. One key legal argument in wrongful death and negligence claims is causation. The actions of the defendants had to actually cause the death or injury of the victim. Another key argument is duty. That is, did the defendants have a duty to protect the victim from harm? And if so, did the defendant's behavior breach that duty? In this case, the jury was tasked with deciding whether the Jenny Jones show and its production company owed Scott Amador a duty to protect him from Jonathan Schmitz's harm. Yeah, it's pretty much like uh, any car accident case is comes under negligence. And someone asked in our Sinisterhood Patreon page, uh, Facebook page, like, what's the difference in negligence and gross negligence? And like negligence comes from you, you know, you generally need to operate a vehicle reasonably, right? You pay attention, you have your hands on the wheel, whatever, not be texting, and you have a duty to do so. And then if you look down and you're texting and you then accidentally run over a pedestrian and injure them, then your behavior caused their injury, right? Like you're looking at your text message, you run over them or whatever, you break their legs. And so that's the argument here was that by Ginny Jones bringing this guy on the show and trigger, quote, you know, quote, unquote, triggering his mental illness or his violent behavior, did they have a duty to pre-screen him? Did they have a duty to tell him in advance that it was going to be male, you know, a male person that's telling him this? And then by not doing those precautions, did they breach that duty to take care of Scott, the other guest? And then by breaching that, they caused his death. That's kind of like the steps that they would have to prove to make the money to, you know, win. So in that uh scenario you gave is that negligence or gross negligence the texting the texting would be negligence gross negligence would be like um instead of driving sitting down you were driving standing up with your head out the sun just like willfully saying fuck it yeah you're there's a famous um oliver wendell holmes quote about it and he says that um i'm trying to remember he says gross negligence is the difference in tripping on the dog and kicking the dog right like If you tripping is like an accident, like negligence is like you shouldn't really be texting, but maybe you just took your eyes off the wheel or you're speeding in the rain. Right. Yeah. You're not like going nuts. But gross negligence would be like you let an eight year old kid drive and you let him hit a blunt. And then, you you know, so it's going like above and beyond something wild. A lot of times med mal medical malpractice claims where they've like left scissors in someone's body is like gross negligence. It's like so far beyond like that, you're just never supposed to leave scissors in someone. No, I think that's uh, day one of medical school is don't you leave know, scissors in somebody's body. Leave leave the surgery with everything you came with. Leave it. And you know what? Leave it a little better than you found it before. That's like right. we want to do to the earth, too. Exactly. A person's inner cavity is like a campsite. There you go. We want to leave it cleaner than we found it. Exactly. Well, so, yeah, exactly. Like you brought up a good point, though, of should they be responsible for screening. And that was something I was thinking of with talk shows in general with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is, is that something that talk shows should have to do? I mean, you're screened to go on a reality show. Do you know how many freaking uh, tests and uh, 
medical tests, personality tests, all your uh, criminal background checks and everything you have to go through to get on Survivor. It's insane. And I wonder, too, like, if they did any kind of, like, criminal background check. Not that this, I, I don't recall that he had, like, a criminal record or something like that. But, you know, you wonder if they, if he did, say he had, had gotten in a bunch of violent bar fights or something like that. And they didn't check that. And they bring him on because here. It was, like, a man hit on him at a bar. He broke a beer Freaked bottle out. and slashed his throat. It's like, okay, probably we shouldn't have this guy on ever, but also yeah. specifically if he's if he's homophobic and has an issue with this. Yeah, and I think Jeffrey Figer was probably trying to prove gross negligence because you can get punitive damages, which is like way more. It's like punishment damages. Normally, if you just sue under negligence, you can get uh, like medical bills, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of consortium, which means like if you're so injured, you can't do it anymore, or, like help with the dishes. And uh, loss of future earnings and stuff. But then if you you can prove gross negligence, then it's um, punitive, which is just money on top of it that the jury awards to punish the person. So normally, and I think he was trying to say by bringing on a person like Jonathan Schmitz, who had mental health condition that was, un, if not undiagnosed, at least just untreated, that that would be the definition of gross negligence, which is common law is like extreme indifference or recklessness, reckless disregard for the safety of others. Like you're so you just wanted to make ratings so bad. You brought this guy on here who ha- was on a hair point trigger and you s- ambushed him and you basically poked the bear, caused him to freak out. You guys did this and you acted. You knew that it could happen and you were indifferent to it. To play devil's advocate for a minute, say they did know that he was bipolar and and depressive and said, you know what? You can't come on our show. Could they then be sued for, um, what is it? Like being, like being prejudicial or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I mean, mean, just because someone has mental health problems doesn't mean that they're always a danger to society or that they shouldn't be allowed to, uh, participate in things that anyone else can. No, I think so. Um, probably not in this situation. Because it's not like it's a job. You can't really be discriminating if you're making art and you're like, we're choosing not to include you in our art. Um, there's, you know, there's usually leeway with the First Amendment of like, we're whether or not you would call Jenny Jones like a press, like freedom of the press, but at least like it freedom is, of speech. But yeah, I mean, it is. And so I think... It's it would be different because it's they're making their art. That would be like saying, you know, I want to come on the show. Why won't you let me on? You're not letting me on for X reason. It's like it's our show. We, we yeah. cover whatever we want. So I think that's the whole, you know, the the crux of the thing here is like it's not that I don't think it was a reasonable expectation for Scott. The the outcome that he was, you know, subjected to here. But I, I think it wasn't foreseeable. And no. And, so, I, don't, I and, don't think so at all. Yeah. Jenny Jones was brought in to testify and spent three days on the stand. She once again called her show lighthearted and said, I think the audience relates to it. I think most everybody at some point have had crushes in our lives. Some people just choose to reveal their crush on TV. Figer doggedly examined and cross-examined witnesses, even becoming combative in some of the exchanges, including with Jenny Jones. During his two-hour closing statement, he asked jurors to be a voice of justice for us all against an industry full of empty souls and absent consciences. Watching his closing argument was like watching paint dry. It was exhausting. Dude, it was be a voice of justice it was like so slow and paced out and the defense attorney afterwards was like he just walked up there he goes i'm not going to keep you here for over two hours i'm going to get to the point he was everyone was so over it if i had been on that jury he would have lost me within 30 (laughs) minutes and like that's the thing is you know that he thinks he's doing this just great job and this very theatrical and dramatic moment and drawing them in but re- really, it's just boring and long-winded, and you're going to lose the jury. Oh, yeah. And I think a lot of times by then, the jurors have kind of made their mind up, True. you know, at least somewhat. Definitely. And honestly, he's on national TV. I think that's a monologue for the cameras. Yeah. That's like a commercial for his next client. Yeah. A two-hour commercial. Good. You can't you can't buy, you know, airtime like that. That's true. On May 8th, 1999, 
The jury deliberated for seven hours. The jury found that the show was indeed negligent and responsible for Scott Amador's death. Their verdict awarded Scott's family $29,332,686 in damages, which included $5 million for pain and suffering, $20 million for the loss of Scott's companionship to his family, and $6,500 for funeral expenses. I will say and that is a fraction of what was awarded on the case I was a part of. Oh, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. We uh, – the case I was on was in the – all over the news because it was the biggest settlement that it has ever been awarded in a civil trial. Oh, wow. Um, And one of the things we had to take into consideration was the loss of companionship. And mm -hmm. it was it was um an infant that was killed during at daycare or he wasn't killed he died but due to negligence from the the daycare owner and we that was one of the things on the jury we struggled with the most was like how can you put a price on the companionship of someone and we honestly came up with a formula a mathematical formula did you really yeah to I mean we were like how do you do this and then and then the is it the four person the person who's kind of in charge of all of uh, this like the foreman yeah. yeah 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 it was a woman so i didn't know if it's still called a foreman um she was like i think this is what we do and we came up with this formula and i don't remember what it was but i mean the baby was like maybe a year when he died and mm -hmm. we were like okay well uh the average age somebody lives is till you know like he would have been like he had zero time to spend with his family times two for the mother and father and it was a very hefty sum the family i don't think saw a dime of it because the woman yeah. didn't have insurance or, or any money to her name but it definitely sent a message but that's something that like how do you it was very like upsetting to know that you're the one that's like putting a price on someone's life and, and you, what you they wanted, missed out on and you definitely want to do their family justice and say look yeah. their life mattered and we care about absolutely them and and yeah, the fact that's... that it was a baby and he didn't even get to start his life, you know, yeah. with his family, like that definitely played into it. But I, I under, it's, it was a, I've never, that's one of the most nervous I've ever been was before we walked back out, knowing that what we had decided mm -hmm. and like, it's like Schrodinger's cat to them on the other side oh, at yeah. that moment. You know what I mean? Like, but you know what it is. It was, it was unnerving. But, I mean, you did the right thing for the, the victim's family, you know, trying to... Absolutely. Yeah, and we uh, talked to but, them afterwards, and, I mean, it was... That case uh, still affects me. It was it was very upsetting. Yeah, that's tough. Well, at the time, an attorney from Warner Brothers TV told the Washington Post that the... Profoundly disturbing verdict... Would have a... Chilling effect... On the format of talk shows, making producers wary of the surprise format, because... Surprise could lead to humiliation, which could lead to violence. However, Joan Gary, executive director of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, or GLAAD, said of the verdict, Let's hope this ruling is a wake-up call to the media that when you play with fire, you get burned. A ruling that denounces media sensationalism and the conviction of a man who killed based on fear and prejudice are not mutually exclusive. Which I think that's fair. I think you Absolutely. can say Jonathan Schmitz is liable for his own actions and also the tv station or the tv show is liable for putting those actions into motion and surprise sure that could lead to humiliation which could lead to violence but i mean driving a car could lead to a wreck that you die in like does that mean yeah. you're not gonna do it like the chances of it happening are slim to none so i a lot of people have um messaged us about a UK tabloid talk show host named mm -hmm. Jeremy Kyle yes. that this all kind of reminded them of. And one reason is because several of his guests have gone on to take their own lives because of humiliating things that happened on the show. I think one was he, apparently he's big on like a lie detector test, which we all know are bullshit anyways. Mm -hmm. And so whatever they would when they were getting tested for on the show, it would come back against them and it would just destroy their lives professionally, personally, everything. And then they would take their own lives. And Horrifying. a lot of people. Yeah. And so I did start to think like, when does the media or shows like that become 
somewhat responsible for what's going on? Yeah, that's a good question because, and like you said, even if you did some type of evaluation before somebody comes on the show, some you don't know how any person, whether somebody has prior issues or conditions or disorders or has never had anything come up before, you don't know how an appearance in the media like that will affect them. So then you get into the issue, which we'll, we'll get into the civil appeal and kind of what happens. But from my perspective, from a legal liability perspective, you get into the issue where the causation of of like what caused that person to take their own life or harm themselves or whatever is so far removed from the TV show that that you it's like that it's not like they went backstage and immediately hurt themselves. You know, it's like, did they go home? Were they then looking at articles on the Internet, which said a bunch of mean stuff and then reading the comments and then people DM'd a bunch of mean stuff to them and that made them really sad. And then their own parents said, I'm ashamed of you for going on the TV show. So it's like. There's a famous case that you learned in law school that's like the the Paul's graph case where this like somebody's running with a box of fireworks or whatever and they like trip and fall and the fireworks like shoots off and then it knocks down a pallet that hits another it's like a Rube Goldberg machine and you start to say okay well whose fault is it that the pallet fell on that guy 30 feet away well had you not shot the firework off the pallet wouldn't have fell True, but then in some cases where the pallet stacked too high, where they stacked by a bad worker. So you start to get too far removed from that incident by the person that you want to hold liable. So you say, okay, Jeremy Kyle brought this guy on the show and, you know, humiliated him by having him do X or confess X or whatever. And then that person went home where you have to, you'd have to really prove a causal connection between those two. And is he morally culpable? Hell yeah. But the question is, when somebody's producing entertainment like Jenny Jones, do you want to say, if anything goes wrong in these people's lives after they're on this show, your ass is on the line. Right. Like, that's that's what I think Warner Brothers meant by this chilling effect, right? You go on the show and you find out your kid that you've raised for the last five years, there's a paternity test, he's not your kid, you get so sad, you jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, is then that, you know, is that the fall to the show? Is that just, you agreed right. to go on and find out that, so anyway... So I think that's always fascinating to try to trace back the causation of what happened. Yeah. And I think, too, it gets into real sticky territory with the First Amendment. If you were going to start mm -hmm. censoring what talk shows could have because, well, this could lead to that. Then you're like mm -hmm. just in this police state where we've lost the freedom of speech Correct. because we're all and And like you said, you can't. I mean, somebody could go on and learn that their spouse of 25 years has been sleeping with their brother the entire time and be like, all right. And they don't miss a day of work because they just don't yes. care. And then yeah. that's another person that's, you know, they they drive their car off a bridge on the, way, on the way home. So just because something is like terrible news doesn't mean somebody's going to react like that. Also, they could go on and find out like uh, their, their dog isn't purebred and they were convinced that this show dog has been purebred and that's like the worst news. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's some, it's like foreseeability. Like you can't, the, I think you couldn't foresee the way this ended from no, a legal perspective. Yeah, and it's all subjective as to what mm -hmm. is going to just trigger someone into acting irrational. So that's, that's always the question that the courts will ask is, is it foreseeable? Like, is this their job to protect this person? And if so, is it a foreseeable outcome that right. occurred it would yeah. have been foreseeable one could argue if they had done a background or if jonathan schmitz when the producers called said i'll tell you right now if if it's a guy that has a crush on me i'm gonna shoot him with a shotgun three days after this this mm -hmm. tapes okay then yeah we all saw that coming but yeah that, he acted totally he didn't seem bothered he was fine he was mm -hmm. affable he was in a good mood they all said there was not one thing that would have indicated that this was going to happen yeah and so I think you're right. I think, or if he said backstage, man, if I get out there and it's a guy, I'm going to fucking kill him. Yeah. They would have to be like, uh, stop the tape. Uh. Yeah. But if he said that and they were like, well, guess what? Go out there, fight him. I mean, in that case, unless I think the Jerry Jones people fighting each other probably either signed a waiver or knew that they maybe were actors, right? Springer? But I think yeah, if, I think for sure. Yeah. But I think if, you know, Scott Amador thinks he's going to sit there and meet somebody and, you know, and get not meet somebody, but get to tell somebody how he feels and doesn't know that Jonathan Schmitz is all jacked up and ready to fight, you know, and he comes out there and hits him with a chair, that's going to be a situation where they did have a duty to protect him. It's on their set. It's within their control. It's within the realm of their control. Yeah. 
According to the Washington Post, the attorneys for Warner Brothers believed the jury was particularly sensitive to gun violence in the wake of the Columbine shootings, which had happened about two weeks before the civil verdict was announced. Jones told the media at the time that she was shocked and saddened by the finding in the civil suit. She continued saying, however, the only real tragedy here is that Scott Amador lost his life. I refuse to lose my faith in the law and in the people I work with, even in the face of this outrageous judgment. It's always interesting when things completely separate from a case that are just happening in the world impact a case. Mm -hmm. Like in OJ's case, the Rodney King thing had just happened. And jurors have even come out and said, um, we were kind of getting justice for Rodney King by letting OJ off. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the police had already, we saw what they did and how they beat the shit out of a black man and and framed him and blah, blah, blah. So, of course, the Rodney King thing is tragic and and awful. It shouldn't have an impact, though, Mm -hmm. on the OJ trial, which was also tragic and awful. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, you let a a guilty man go free because of letting something outside affect you. Wrongly decided. No, for sure. And I think that's the kind of problem but also i guess the good part of the criminal justice system is that it is a jury of you hope your peers you know if you're the defendant you hope they look like you uh most of the time not always the case but you have human beings that are metting out this justice you know it's not we don't have robot judge that's like you have done crime we decide you go like i think that's the problem with mandatory sentences is you take away the human element of a judge that says I'm listening to you talk. I get it. Like, this is why you did something. Here's ways that I think you can get better. I'm going to give you a lower sentence or here are aggravating factors. I'm going to give you a higher sentence. I think when there's, you know, mandatory, I could go into that. (laughs) I could go into mandatory minimum sentences for hours. But I think when you, it's a double-edged sword, right? You have the human element to say, we as the jury think this baby's life is worth, you know, hundreds of a hundred million dollars. Or do you have, and, and, do you have just a chart that you look at and go, if you're this old and this happens to you, then it's this. You know, we right. don't need juries. Yeah. So it's like, it's kind of hard. And you you have juries like this that award 29 million bucks. And it's interesting to think, had Columbine not have happened so recently, would this outcome have been the same? Because I mean, yeah. that shook a nation. And mm-hmm. I could absolutely see something like that affecting any case that came before that involved gun violence yeah and you think after that the jury may say we have to do the you know this gun violence was caused by the media the media is taking advantage of all this this is being filmed you know what somebody's got to pay we're sending gonna a message be, yeah we're going to send a message yep yep the jenny jones show and the other defendants appealed the civil verdict to the michigan court of appeals they argued that they owed no duty to protect scott amador from the violent acts of an unrelated third party like jonathan schmitz The show's arguments were successful. On January 17, 2003, the Court of Appeals agreed and held that Under the circumstances, the defendants owed no legally cognizable duty to protect plaintiff's decedent from the homicidal acts of a third party. And that's uh, anytime you're wanting to sue somebody for the criminal acts of a third party, there's a lot of extra stuff you have to prove. So like, say you're at a hotel and you go downstairs uh, and out the back door to smoke a cigarette and it's like dark and you're by the dumpster and someone mugs you or, you know, assaults you or whatever. And you, but you're on the hotel property, right? You can't sue the hotel for that because they didn't they couldn't have foreseen that. But then you go in and you tell the manager, hey, I got mugged out there behind the dark dumpster where it's super dark. And the manager goes, yeah, OK, whatever. Just go back to your room. And the next night, another person goes down there. They go out to smoke a cigarette behind the dumpster. They get mugged. That guy, guy number two gets to sue because the hotel was aware of the circumstances and situation and said, yeah, we don't give a shit. We're not going to do anything. But had the def- had the hotel installed, say, floodlights and mm-hmm. got a security guard that was walking around and, you know, had whatever cameras and then somebody got mugged, they w- had taken reasonable precautions. And then they can't really be held liable for the acts of a third party. So here, like the Jenny Jones show, like, I think there this was a tenuous argument at best. And I think Jeffrey Figer got he came out the best because he got the publicity he wanted mm-hmm. and nobody got any money. The appellate court also said in their decision that the Jenny Jones show had no duty to anticipate and prevent the acts of murder committed by Schmitz three days after leaving defendant's studio and hundreds of miles away. The Michigan Supreme Court refused to hear Scott's family's appeal of the appellate court decision. 
That meant that the holding at the appellate level, which wiped out their $20 million verdict, stood. In the end, the Amador family was unable to recover any money from the Jenny Jones show for the loss of their son and brother. It's wild, right? Here's, here's something I've been thinking about since last night. And it sounds, I know it's going to sound probably ignorant and dumb when I say it out loud, but I'm going to say it anyways. What is, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say it, but then I'm going to clarify something because even in my head now, I'm like, okay, I can see why they would do this. I have a coworker that always goes, a question is not dumb if it's the first time you're asking it. Oh, I love that. Well, this is the first yeah. time I've asked that. So mm-hmm. um, here you go. If a verdict can be overturned at any level, why don't we just send the cases to that level in the first place? That's not a dumb question. That's a great question. I think because it's a funnel system, right? So it's meant to weed out the cases that are slam dunks, right? So like, say this was a slam dunk case, then they appealed it to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals would have said, we uphold it. No decision. It took it. No, you know, no analysis. We agree. We upheld it. And then you would appeal it again to the court, Supreme Court and they'll go, yeah, we don't have anything on it. It looks great. The appellate system is designed to answer the tough questions that don't fit the facts easily. The tough legal questions that don't fit the facts. A lot of times you'll see, especially in criminal cases, the appellate level is they're tasked with determining questions of law. And juries are tasked with determining questions of fact. So like at the Mm -hmm. criminal level, if it's like, do you think that's the person that did it? Or do you think this witness was credible? That's all stuff for the jury to decide. If it's like, should this piece of evidence have been let in? That's a question of law. And that's for the appellate level to decide. So for here, this is a question of there's no question of fact here. I mean, we all know what happened. He went on the show. They went home. He went to his house, in my opinion, premeditated, murdered him. And so there's no questions of fact here. So the question of law for the appellate court was, did the the production company owe a duty? You know, was this foreseeable? Should they be held liable for the acts of a third party? So they're allowed to. So the appellate court's allowed to opine on the question of law versus a question of fact. And then you have the Supreme Court who just says, yeah, you guys nailed it. Got it right. Thanks. We don't need it. We don't need to look at this. I think that I'll put a link in the show notes, but I think the Supreme Court opinion is like, six lines long or something like that mm. and of course jeffrey figer threw everything at the or whoever the appellate attorney was i assume he probably had a part in it uh but i think it's they he'd like try to throw stuff that the some kind of there was an amicus brief filed which is usually it's a friend of a court brief which means somebody that isn't a part of the case but has like an interest in the case or whatever from like yeah a business. they said that um like six or seven networks filed those yes. on behalf of jenny jones show saying mm-hmm. because they're all other talk shows and they're they're may work for major networks if this changes like the face of everything it affects them too mm-hmm. and the appellate court and the supreme court will take that into consideration you see them all the time at the the federal supreme court level you tons of amicus briefs and honestly if you're ever like i don't really know what's going on in this case you know there's a big case everybody's talking about reading through some amicus briefs like usually gives you a pretty clear understanding because they're from it's almost like a third party perspective explaining what's going on in the context of what's going on but anyway the the, the appellate uh, i'm sorry the um people representing the production company in this case tried to get some supreme court uh, some michigan supreme court justices to recuse themselves because they said they had a conflict of interest because some of the it was it's in the the decision but the the supreme court basically said this is a bullshit argument none of us are conflicted out but they were just trying to throw everything they could at it to to get the verdict to to with uphold the verdict or whatever so i don't know well that makes sense thank you for explaining that it makes oh, sense yeah. the the law versus question the, of the, the the yeah the the weird thing about it is i mean anytime somebody's guilty getting given a guilty sentence almost every time they would appeal i imagine Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. it's just like this weird process that like okay that's but you immediately know that's what we're going to do we're going to try and but then like it also gets to a point like with the with scott's family where they're like no we're not going to hear your appeal yeah and they they basically said we've reviewed everything and we think that the appellate court got it right so we don't need to hear your arguments because uh, uh, the question of law has already been answered that you don't have a duty to them. So then this cannot stand like this verdict can't stand. 
and there was no ar- there was no new arguments in there that would have changed anything at the that had been decided at the appellate level. So I think that's the good thing about the court systems. You know, you always have the initial court, the appellate, and then the Supreme. And then, you know, depending on the issue, whether you could go the federal route, too. And it's good because you have multiple sets of eyes looking at something, right? Mm -hmm. So, you you know. That's true. Yeah. A bunch of opinions. Sinisterhood will return after this. We are supported by Fab Fit Fun. All right, y'all. The 2020 Fab Fit Fun Summer Box is on sale. Yes, it is summer. As we were talking about earlier, it's officially summer. It is hot, hot as hot as hot AF, as they like to say, as the mm-hmm. kids like to say. And the uh, FFF new box is perfect to get you all primed and ready for that. In case you did not know, Fab Fit Fun is a seasonal women's lifestyle subscription box that you get full size premium stuff in it it's beauty stuff lifestyle fitness home wellness everything you need to live a fab fit fun life super cute stuff this month too i am first of all i love reese witherspoon and Mm -hmm. she is the face of draper james so when Mm -hmm. i saw that a draper james bag was coming my way i got super excited it's It's super cute you got it too didn't you yes so cute it's woven it has a really cute scarf tied around it it's perfect for the summer i also got some tom's sunglasses fabulous designer and very cute and some mineral sunscreen by kula so i'm literally totally prepared to go to my inflatable pool in my backyard because that's (laughs) the only place i'm going these days you will be but i look super fly while doing it exactly the most fabulous girl at the party um (laughs) of one no i got the lifestyle co beach mist so whenever i go for my outside runs and walks in the sun i can come back and have very lovely uh you know it takes care of my skin after being out exposed to the sun Mm -hmm. and i got a silk satin pillow sleeve so it goes over my very comfy pillow and it helps with like acne, oily skin, my hair, it keeps everything soft. And I'm currently wearing hydropeptide moisture rest face oil that my skin, I don't have a baby, but I feel like it feels like a baby's bottom. It is so it soft. It looks like, like a baby's. It looks like if I, I would compel it to, compare it to Ella's butt. Thank you so much. That, <laughs> there's so no welcome. higher, no <laughs> higher compliment. And the cool thing is, is they are eight, the, each box comes with eight to 10 full size products. So these, that peptide oil I got on my face, it's full size, y'all. Yes, and you ma'am. can customize. So if you're like, I'm not feeling some sunglasses, I want that oil, get that or get both. You get yes. up to four products customized based on your wants and needs. Yes, it's a great gift for yourself. Self-care is super important, especially in times like these, or a very thoughtful gift for others. Again, we're all stressed out. We could all use a little something to look forward to. Send this to somebody that maybe you can't see right now, but this is a great way to say, hey, I'm still thinking of you, and here's some awesome stuff. It's like at-home pampering in a yes. box. And the box is normally forty nine ninety nine. but if you go to FabFitFun.com and use our coupon code CREEPY, you get $10 off your first box. And each box has a product uh, value of over $200. So you're, all, you're getting it for 50 bucks or less. Yes. Also, there is a super fun and active community that comes along with signing up. There's FabFitFun TV and a FabFitFun community that you all get to become a part of after you sign up. So just head to FabFitFun.com and remember, enter coupon code CREEPY so you can get all your cool stuff today. You can match us with our bags. Yes. Well, Jenny Jones never took any responsibility for the heinous murder that happened after Jonathan Schmitz and Scott Amador appeared on her show. In her memoir, Jenny Jones, My Story, released in 1997, she insisted that Jonathan Schmitz truly, truly was not ambushed. We are definitely not to blame. Then in an interview with People magazine in 1999, she reiterated her stance, saying, It was not the Jenny Jones murder. It was the Jonathan Schmitz murder. She went on to say the ordeal caused her to become cynical and distrustful of the media. Nevertheless, the Jenny Jones show continued airing on syndicated stations across the country for an additional eight years after the slaying. It was eventually canceled in 2003 due to low ratings. Yeah, this was the the end of an era. Jenny Jones, Jerry Springer, all of them, they all started dropping like flies in the early 2000s. Someone DM'd and said that was his name Steve, who was like Jerry Springer's main security guy. He mm-hmm. has a spinoff show now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so oh. good for him. 
You know what? He He, keeps the name alive. He's keeping the legacy alive. If Steve has a spinoff show, then I want Bert from Judge Judy to have a spinoff show. Oh, is he the... He's the bailiff. The bailiff? Mm Mm-hmm. Man. Well, as we know from courtroom dramas, the bailiffs are usually the best ones. Bull, I'm talking about you. What's up? What's up, (laughs) Night Court? Oh, man. So great. That's why I'm a lawyer, is Night Court. That You know what? I should if anything would have made me a lawyer, it would have been that show. <laughs> Judge Harry Stone as well. Oh, lawyer. so great. <laughs> I wrote an essay when I was intern to get an internship with the courts and my essay was all about Harry Stone. But you know what? You should be yourself in, in interviews and essays because I got picked by a very funny judge to be his intern. And I was like, there what if go. I had written a boring thing? And he was like, this is very funny. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Cool, man. Jeffrey Figer, who represented the Amador family in the civil suit expressed outrage at the Ginny Jones show, saying, That show set Schmitz up and certainly took Scott Amador's life for no reason. And concluded that everyone involved in the show deserved jail time as well. Frank Amador Jr., Scott's older brother, agreed, telling Click on Detroit, It sickens me. He said the Ginny Jones show and its producers were criminals. They're just as guilty as Schmitz. I feel Schmitz was just a trigger guy. In an interview with People Magazine, Frank said of his brother's murderer, He was a victim, too. I don't argue that. I blame the producers probably just as much because it was their job to go out and find people that they could exploit. That's what they do for a living. Well, I certainly don't agree that the show set him up and took Scott's life for no reason. (laughs) I think that if, you know, you're feeling like the murderer got second degree murder or, you know, got convicted of second degree got a lo- fairly low prison sentence, you're probably looking to place, you know, emotionally, you want to sure. say, like, why did this happen? You know? Oh, I'm talking about Figer. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no I, I completely understand the Amador's position that you, you're looking for answers and justice and closure and probably placing blame on whoever. I, I think that 100%, though, they totally feel in their heart of hearts that the Jenny Jones show is responsible for their brother and son now being dead. Yeah. And I think, and that's the the question too, is, you know, it, I think the appellate court hit the nail on the head of like, this was an incident that happened hundreds of miles away and several days after it. So it's not like he said, I can't wait to get home and kill someone. You know, right. they were laughing and hugging and high-fiving each other. So as far as the show knew, they were like, all right, guys, have a good day. Well, and the producer said that Scott called him the next day and said, we went out, we had a few drinks, we had what he called a, quote, love connection, and that they hooked up. And, and several of Scott's friends testified that, yeah, he told us that he and Jonathan slept together. So whether that's true or not, the producers were like, oh, cool, maybe this worked out for the best. Yeah, it's not like they got a threatening phone call or a threatening right. letter or had anything. So I think that, that could be true. I also think, you know, would Scott Amador be dead at the time that he was his life was taken but for this show? And I don't think so. You know, I don't. Right. But that's not to say that weeks or months after this, they're all. it's John O'Reilly's birthday and they're all together and he goes over and whispers something in his ear and then... You know, Jonathan Schmitz freaks out later. You know, I think I think we talked about this in the first one. Just he was kind of a uh, making bad, deci- unreasonable decisions. And if not Scott Amador, I think it maybe would have been another victim. Yeah. Also, if we're going to put the Jenny Jones show on trial, uh, Jonathan Schmitz's dad needs to be on trial. Yeah, right. For all if of we're... his homophobic just uh language and and attitude and encoding and rating him, him yeah with with all and telling him how you should be ashamed you should be embarrassed i would do something if i were you and years and years of that that's encoding, way more yeah. destructive than a two-hour long taping where you mm-hmm. find something out on august 24th 2017 at 47 years old jonathan schmitz was released from the parnell correctional institute in jackson michigan after having served 22 years in prison. The conditions of his release included restrictions that prohibited him from leaving the state or changing his residence without the permission of his probation officers. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Frank Amador Jr. said, I wanted assurance that the parole board's decision was not based on just good behavior in prison. I'd like to know that he learned something, that he's a changed man, is no longer homophobic, and has gotten psychological care. 
Schmitz was on parole until August 22, 2019, after which he became free to live his life. So he's he's completely free as of now, mm-hmm. as far Out as the about. courts are concerned. Mm-hmm. 50-something years old and done time and how, uh, you know, not probably not easy when you meet a new friend and they Google your name. And this comes no, up. and I imagine it's not easy to get a, a job or um, really anything or go go out in public. I mean, he's his face is all over the news and everything. So he's free. He's free in a sense, but he's still definitely a prisoner in other senses. And I mean, I think, you know, you ask the victim's family, like, if. He, he's a changed man. He's gotten psychological care. He's no longer homophobic. You know, he's paid his debt to society. Um, I think it was the wrong verdict and the wrong sentence that he yeah. got. But yeah, no, he should have got first degree murder 100 percent. One lasting impact of this case and other similar cases involving violence against LGBTQ persons was a legal theory sometimes referred to as the gay panic defense or the trans panic defense. The basis of the defense is that sexual advances by either someone of the same sex or a trans person are so outrageous that they elicit violent responses. This, of course, is simply untrue and rooted in deeply homophobic and transphobic ideologies. Since the prevalence of the defense throughout the 1990s, there have been calls from leaders in the LGBT and the legal community for bans across the country. The bans would prevent defendants from using the nonviolent sexual advances of gay and trans victims as mitigating circumstances in violent crimes, including murder. Yeah. Absent these bans, you it's perfectly fine for your defense attorney to tell the jury basically what Jonathan Schmitz's attorney said, which is what don't you see why he would freak out and commit murder? He was hit on by a man. Yeah. And like. That sounds so archaic to you and I, and hopefully people that listen to this, I like to think we have a fairly intelligent, progressive audience. Yeah. But the fact that through throughout the 90s and in some jurisdictions still today, that mm-hmm. that's a thing that you can say and the jury has to take that into account in a jury charge is it, it boggles the mind. Yeah, it it certainly does. I mean, it doesn't, right? <laughs> It, it's horrifying, but it's like, oh, is yeah. it really surprising that shitty people have been using shitty defenses forever? No. No, and I mean, like, you could replace black and white mm-hmm. with gay and straight. Yeah. And, I mean, that's a constant thing, too, we see all the time. Mm-hmm. Are there any bands like that? Um, I That's a great question. I I mean, obviously... Race was used as a mitigating factor. I mean, from Emmett Till, which we found out later was, I mean, it was at the time was wrong, but then we found out the whole case was bullshit. I mean, up through probably the Civil Rights Act. I imagine I'd have to look at the exact laws for this one. I just looked into the the gay and the trans panic defenses, but uh, I would you'd be hard pressed, I think, for a jury to stomach that nowadays. Well, you I know? mean, but but prosecution and defense i mean they still use that like i mean it's still mm-hmm. very race driven and in certain i mean trayvon martin i mean any yeah i mean they're all it's like race plays a huge factor so why they might not be coming so. out saying he was a black man therefore this white woman has every reason to mm-hmm. shoot him in her home like it might not be no pun intended that black and white of how they're saying it but it is very much still coded in everything that's going on yeah heavily implied of if you saw a person looking like the defendant walking down the street wouldn't you say which also side note in our uh, my mix bag that uh, we're going to record later talking a little bit about the criminal justice system and uh, a documentary series i saw that discusses kind of some of the racial issues in the witness identification in the criminal justice system so again you know it's it's stuff that's not outright. I think that you wouldn't outright say, well, this woman was attacked. This white woman was attacked. But I think it's like you said, it's coded language. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But but in this case, in the gay, tra- pan- the gay panic defense and the trans panic defense, it is uh, not coded. It is completely verbalized and saying this person died because they were a trans person or a gay person that hit on someone. You should therefore give the defendant a break in what they did. I mean, outright, that's what the, that's what the ask is to wow. the jury, which is sick. Yeah, yeah. 
In 2013, the American Bar Association, an organization that serves as a national representative of the legal profession, called for the federal government in all states to enact bans on the so-called gay and trans panic defenses. So far, 10 states have banned the defense, including California, Illinois, Rhode Island, Nevada, Connecticut, Maine, Hawaii, New York, New Jersey, and Washington. Texas, seven other states, and Washington, D.C. have had bans introduced in their legislatures, but have not yet passed them into law. And then any other states not listed still have them, and you can still you can still use that as a defense. Well, That's I how- wish Texas would get on board. Seriously, well, and it's I, been... I say that, uh, goddamn, I say that every day, it seems like, these, <laughs> about these, these days. Everything, everything about that they're everything. doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, and I think Texas, it's been introduced multiple times, but that's how prevalent this is, that out of 50 states, we have 10 that it's actually banned in. That means 40 states, you can still use that. Yeah, that's, that's... It's sick. Uh, it, like you said, it boggles the mind, it's sick, it's nauseating, it's so archaic it's insane that this is 2020 and that's the statistics on that Mm -hmm. according to the lgbt bar in july of 2018 a federal bill called the gay and trans panic defense prohibition act of 2018 was introduced by senator markey a democrat from massachusetts in the united states senate and by congressman kennedy also a democrat from massachusetts in the united states house of representatives This bill generally prohibits a federal criminal defendant from asserting, as a defense, the nonviolent sexual advance of an individual or a perception or belief of the gender, gender identity, or expression, or sexual orientation of an individual, excuses or justifies conduct or mitigates the severity of an offense. It's almost, I mean, if you didn't know any better, you'd be like, we don't even need this. Of course no one could do that. But they still can, at the federal level even. Yeah, yeah. Is the LGBT bar the bar, like the um, American Bar Association, but specifically LGBT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of affinity bars. There's like, you have like the Latino bar, you'd have the LGBT bar, you have uh, like a predominantly black attorney bar. So there's just various different types of bars that you can get involved with if you're get involved with if you're part of that affinity group. And then also, even if you're not part of the affinity group, if you, you know, want to help the cause, you know, help what they're they're after. So I think this is a, a cause that attorneys are just human beings of any any strike to get behind because it's shouldn't be going on. No, no. Congressman Kennedy, who sponsored the bill, said in a press release, as long as gay and trans panic defenses are allowed in our state and federal courts, the LGBTQ community will be deprived of the justice all Americans deserve. With other states already implementing bans, we have the federal momentum to outlaw this bigoted legal practice across the country. The bill was once again introduced in the House and the Senate in June of 2019 and remains pending. I think these two uh, congressmen have taken it, kind of taken it upon themselves, and they introduced it in 2018, and then when it didn't go anywhere, they reintroduced it in 2019. So I think they're, they're going to keep pushing it, which is good. Like you said, we're very liberal and progressive, so maybe I, I see it through a different lens. Well, I, I mean, I, I see it through the only lens you should be seeing it through. This is crazy that this is even a question. Mm-hmm. This should have been introduced, and everyone said, oh, my God, we don't already have this band? Exactly. Oh, gavel banged. Immediate. This is immediate. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see... What's the holdup? What's the argument? What's anybody hold, just dragging their feet on about this? That's why, first of all, we say this a lot, but that's why state level elections are super important because yeah. at the state level, that's who majority of the like a, a criminal act is going to be prosecuted at the state level. So the federal ban that these two lovely Congress people from uh, Massachusetts are pushing is great and it needs to happen at the federal level, too. But what is really going to move the needle is going to be at the state level. And that's a great question of what the hell is your counter argument? Mm -hmm. Except for you have stepped out of a time machine in the 1960s or whenever that was even remotely reason. It's it's never been reasonable. First of all, like what archaic mind would think that it's it is a legalized way to say the victim was asking for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100 percent. This would it's the equivalent to be like she was wearing a skirt. So, of course, yeah. I assaulted her. Like, yeah. she was yeah. asking for she it by virtue of existing. Yeah. She no, had it's a like, tube top on. 
Yeah, by existing and being a, just living your life freely as you as an American are allowed to do, you're being punished for it, and it's you've brought this upon yourself by your existence. Bullshit. This is these laws are they're not laws actually. They're just defenses that are used, and then we need the laws to ban their use. Yeah, it is. Uh... Man, stuff like this makes me wish I was in politics. Yes, yeah, seriously. Just because if there's one thing I can do, it's uh, argue with someone over mm-hmm. something I'm super passionate about that I feel like I try and see both sides of an argument. This There's only one side of the there's, argument when it comes to something like this. There's no Full side. Stop. Yeah, yeah, there's no side. It's just this is how it is. Yes, and it's uh completely insane. Like, like I said, I'd like to hear someone's counter argument, but then again, I probably wouldn't because it's a, probably horrifying. Yeah, no, it, their counter argument is, uh, well, it says in the Bible that it's not right to be gay, so a gay man shouldn't be hitting on us. I mean, it's all going to go back yeah. to something like that, yeah, which is like for sure. how you can't reason with someone that thinks like that. Yeah, but you can pass laws and bills that make it so that ignorance can't even be set foot in a courtroom and you throw their ass in jail under premeditated murder which i think is what this is Mm -hmm. i think that had that had this been banned when this all happened i think you would have saw a different trial and you would have seen all the all the shit about well maybe you know his sexuality he was confused about it's like no this is what happened on the jenny jones show this is what happened afterwards that was premeditated murder you cannot mitigate his culpability just because his victim happened to be a man, you know, a same sex, he received nonviolent sexual advances of a same sex person. That is not a mitigating factor. Throws ass in jail for premeditated murder. Preach it. Whew. Well, I would say, so what do we think? But I think we had just covered said it. what I think we all, I think we just we said just, what we, what we think. We just said it. Yeah. The, I think uh, to summarize, I think the jury got it wrong. Mm-hmm. I guess in the second trial, they weren't even given the option for first degree murder. So at least in that trial, they I think got they it. were. They had the option. Oh, they were. Yeah, they just also included me. He convinced the. Uh, the okay. The, well, the then uh, I take back what I was going to say. And both juries got it wrong. Yes. Um, and but I do think that the civil lawsuit should have been overturned. As I do not think, while we've said morally was it what the Ginny Jones show did wrong, probably. But mm-hmm. legally, I don't think they they were culpable in that and or could have foreseen that something like this would have happened. Yeah, no, you're uh, on both. I completely agree on both accounts. Yeah. And the civil case, it feels icky because you're like, this family deserves something. Yeah. But under the law, as it is written and has been promulgated throughout the years, just Warner Brothers was not legally responsible. Yeah. Like you said, morally, though, hell yeah. And I actually yeah. think, I can't remember if it was the appellate decision or the Supreme Court decision was like, Although morally reprehensible, they are not legally responsible. <laughs> so I mean, there it's you, you know, it's even the they're supposed to be, I guess, impartial. But the even the the appellate level judges were like, "This is icky. We feel bad. Sorry." Yeah, the law is the law, though. The law is the law. Unless well, you know change you, it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The law doesn't Unless, always have to be the law. Exactly. Pass a bill, and uh, hey, I'm looking at you, fifty other states. You need to get yes. your ass in gear. And uh, I don't know what what else you're doing right now but you should stop and just sign those papers that's how yeah. bills work right you just sign a paper just, and then it's enacted it, um you have to bang a gavel too come on okay well it's bang those gavels bitches. but also we didn't even get into it but there's gay panic defenses are allowed in many jurisdictions internationally as well so even if you're not in the u.s check who your elected representatives are there may be something you could do uh where you live and wikipedia has a lovely long list and the lgbt bar as well has a lovely long list of uh places that the shit needs to get changed yep we people are more powerful than they give themselves credit for that's true i'd love that well, what a lovely you. what a lovely positive note probably i probably go you. on our quotes for this week that's great <laughs> please well we've been seeing it so much in the in the media lately is like all these horrific speaking of racially driven crimes that have mm-hmm. been going on that have happened months ago mm-hmm. and because not because of police or anybody that wants you to find out about this, but because like 
videos get leaked and the community Mm -hmm. demands justice and and is outraged and shares these horrific videos and everything that go viral. That's how the public is learning about these things that are happening. Mm -hmm. It's not because of our our justice system. Mm -mm. It's because of people like us. So Mm -hmm. your voice matters. Use it. You, I love that. Again, no, another good I'm one. I'm on. I'm on. A, I'm on one right now. <laughs> I'm into it. I'm, I'm love when very you're on riled one. up about this whole <laughs> gay trans panic defense, and now I'm probably going to go in there and just preach to Tommy, and he'll be like, <laughs> "I am trying to play Animal Crossing." Actually, no, we're going to probably going to go binge Ozark. We're very into Ozark right oh, now. Oh, really, dude? Season three is so good. Oh, nice. Well, let us know what you guys think. Um yeah yeah this was a it's a a tough one overall and hopefully hopefully nothing like this ever happens again but if it does i think juries would be more apt to get it right i hope so too well we love providing sinisterhood to you at no cost so if you like what you hear consider supporting the show by donating to our patreon we are a small operation creating the show for you by researching writing recording and producing it ourselves Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content like our weekly mix bags where we share three of our favorite things of the week. For more details on specific membership tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner to join today. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch, and we love it. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, and totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy and Wallace. Heather? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. And keep it creepy. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Jay Porter. Nicole Browning, Melissa Cooper, Zara Swanee, Rexanne Greenstreet, Ann Yarbrough, Hillary Bolger, Leslie Morris, Kate Wolf, Liz Hilt, Lauren, Samantha A. Valentine, Nate, Caitlin Danziger, Films About Lunatics, Kristen Kennedy, Josie Spain. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We love you. We appreciate you. And keep it creepy. Wahahaha. Sinister. Hood.